resting comfortably. I don't know how comfortably after two days of surgery, but everything went well. Thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, Pastor Darrell will be in the hospital for another week or so and hopefully back with us again um, in six or eight weeks. I wonder how many of you can recall where you were 15 years ago today at just about this time. I can. If I remember right, it was a Tuesday morning. And I was uh, uh, working at a church in North Carolina. I was uh, out and around with a friend of mine. We went to uh, borrow a portable baptistry from another church because our church didn't have a place to baptize believers. And that coming Sunday, we were to baptize a group of believers. And when the news started coming in that our nation was under attack, I don't know about you, but I didn't believe it. There's no way that anyone would or could attack the United States of America. And as the rest of that day unfolded, horrors that we couldn't imagine were found to be true. As I look back on 9-11 and the events of 9-11, it just reinforces all over again for me why we need Jesus. We need Jesus because this world is a dangerous, evil place. 9-11 brought that to our attention in the worst, starkest way. But not only is it dangerous and evil in a physical sense, the world is a dangerous place spiritually as well. This place is not the friend of our souls. This world is out to bring us down spiritually. And we need Jesus. And here's another reason why 9-11 shows us that we need Jesus. It's because only Jesus can take a tragedy like that and turn it into a triumph. I think about who we are as a people. And Tom James and I were talking about this before the service. In some way or another, in some fashion, we're all broken. We're all hurting. None of us really have it all together. But somehow, our Lord can take the mess that is our life and make it meaningful and useful and redeeming for the kingdom of God. My friends, we need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. And boy, as luck would have it, you've come to the right place because right now Jesus is here. Jesus is listening to you. And so right now we're going to pray together. And as I pray, I invite you to realize that I'm not the only one that can talk to Jesus as we pray. You can speak to him too. In fact, I'm pretty sure he would really like to hear from you this morning. So as we pray, I invite you in the quietness of your heart to speak to him. Tell him about what that stuff is going on in your life. Ask him for the help that you need. We need Jesus. And Jesus is here now. Let's talk to him. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Lord and our Master. We quiet our hearts and we bow our heads on this.
day your day? The day of the week that God set aside to be treated differently than any other day. Our Lord, we bow our hearts and we open our hearts to you. Lord, this is a this is a different day in the history of our country. Because 15 years ago we suffered in a way that maybe we never have before. And Father, since that time, things have not ever been the same for us. But I think if we look and then we think, then even the horrible tragedy that was 9-11 can point us toward you. And this morning, I'm reminded that we need you. It's true that this world is not our home. You intended for your creation to be way different than this. But thankfully, you have the power to redeem what's broken. You have the ability to fix what went wrong. You have the power and the will to take a broken, hurting life and to recreate it into something beautiful and useful. Thanks to you, we don't have to sit on the sidelines of life just because of a mistake, but instead we can experience forgiveness and healing. Thanks to you, no circumstance is hopeless. No person is hopeless. No sin or no mistake is final. No brokenness is permanent. So this morning, for anyone that is broken, anyone that is hurting, anyone that is confused, anyone that is far away from you, my prayer is that you would heal and restore and repair and recreate. Father, we spend a moment praying for Pastor Darrell this morning. And I ask you to reach down into the hospital room where he is and give him strength and rest and healing. Thank you for carrying him through this difficult procedure. And I pray that you would raise him up again. And now, Lord, we have spent time worshiping you and declaring through singing and praying how wonderful you are and how you rule and how important it is that the Holy Spirit is in our lives. And now it comes time to be confronted with the truth of the Word of God. Lord, I pray that when Chris speaks that truth would be heard. And I pray that you would use that truth to change us into a man or a woman who is more like you. That's our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, you're wondering what the weights are for. Uh, let me tell you what the weights are for. Um, it's in case you fall asleep, I throw it at your face. And so, um, no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. We'll get to the weights. Um, so, yeah, no weights will be thrown, hopefully. Um, hey, so welcome to Christ Community. I am very, very glad that you're here. My name is Chris Weatherly. I am the youth pastor here. And I do just kind of want to reinforce, if this is your first or second time being with us, man, we, 
we know it's hard to find a church, and we're just glad you kind of chose to come and be with us for a morning. We're very excited, and we'd love for you to be able to find a home. Now, if this is your first week, or you weren't here last week, you were on vacation, you were at the beach, you were wherever, um, then you are walking into week two of a series on James, the book of James, that is going to take us all the way up till Thanksgiving. We're going to be in James for quite a while and so if you weren't here, it's okay, because James is kind of different than a lot of other books in this sense. James is kind of like little mini sermons all throughout the book. And so it, it has this unifying theme throughout the book, but it's also kind of these little individual sermons. And so if you missed last week... That's okay. You can go to our website, aplacetobelong.com, and you can rewatch last week's sermons, sermon or any of the other sermons from previous weeks. You can even go to our church app, and you can check out the sermons on there. I'd love for you to go back, take time, rewatch the sermons. Um, that will help you gain an even better understanding for this series going forward. But let me kind of recap just a little bit about James. Kind of two things that we talked about James. Um, James is incredibly direct. We talked about these kind of two kind of friends that we have. One is the ever encourager and the other is just the brutally honest type friend. James is the brutally honest type friend. He's kind of that guy that feels like he slaps you in the face then gives you a hug and you're like, I don't know how to feel about this. That's James. It's just who he is. He's very, very, very direct. But in the end... He's incredibly encouraging. And the other thing that we talked about is, and I want you to kind of keep this in the back of your brain throughout the rest of the series, is that James was the brother of Jesus. And I ask you this question, what would it take you to be completely convinced that your brother was the savior of the world? I got a brother, he ain't convincing me. Like, he, it's just not happening. And, I mean, maybe your brother, you're like, ah, oh, he's on the fence. No, I don't think so. Like, it's just not happening. But, but James was absolutely convinced that Jesus was not only the Son of God, but that he was the Savior of the world, that he wrote an entire letter telling us how we should live for Jesus. He talks about what does faith in Jesus look like on the ground. How does faith work? Okay, so that's kind of what I need you to remember. Now, we're going to jump into today's message. Just by show of hands, how many of you like to work out? You love working out. Should you raise your hand? Okay, yeah. Um, how many of you, you wish you liked to work out? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, I like that. That's better. Um, how many of you, it's just no, just not happening. Just a no, yeah, okay, I like your honesty. I appreciate that. Yeah, there, there's some of us that it's like, <laughs> no, not really. Well, I used to, used to being the key term, um, I, I wear baggy shirts, so you can't tell if I'm bulky or not. And so um, I used to, in high school, I loved to work out. Now, um, you can't tell, and please don't look at the numbers. These are 50-pound weights. And so, yeah, look, I mean, look at easily. 50-pound weights. And you're like, oh, I couldn't do that. They're for sure 50 pounds. A pastor wouldn't lie on stage. And so um, don't look at the numbers. But uh, I loved working out in high school. And one of the reasons I loved working out so much in high school is that I loved sports. I mean, I loved every sport. I mean, I love football. I love soccer. I love basketball, baseball. You name it. I love sports. I thought about sports all the time. It was a huge, huge portion of my life. Now, there was a slight problem, and the slight problem is that I didn't weigh anything or have any muscles, and so I was like this super little skinny kid. I kind of look like a lollipop. I'm just a stick with a big head. That's kind of what I look like in, in school, and so I worked out all the time. When I say I worked out all the time, like I'm really not exaggerating. I worked out at least six days a week, every single week for a few years. Like I worked out regularly. And my workout partner, um, he actually went on to play college football. Like he was this jack dude. He was fast, strong, awesome. Um, and we'd work out all the time. And I mean, we did stupid stuff. I mean, really stupid stuff. Like for football training, what we would do is we would do 50-yard sprints while pulling 100-pound sleds on our back. 
I mean, that's just dumb, right? Like, looking back, I'm like, moron. But back then, I was like, I have a future in football. Yay. Okay, maybe not. But, you know, like, I just, I loved sports, and I was completely committed to sports, and I was completely committed to working out all the time. I even had, like, this diet that I was on to try to gain weight and try to gain muscle mass and all this type of stuff. And, I, I mean, I just love it. And I remember... I remember we were in the, the um, weightlifting room at our, at our high school, and we just got done bench pressing, and I mean, I'm not going to tell you how much I did because it was embarrassing, but um, I, I just got done um, bench pressing, and, and we're sitting there, and we're just talking, and I said what quite possibly might be the dumbest thing I ever said as a teenager. I don't know. I, I said a lot of dumb things, but here's what I said. Here's what I said. I said, I don't understand how adults can just not work out. The great and brilliant Chris Weatherly. Yes, that was also <laughs> the, the tagline. Yes. I just sat there. I mean, I'm sitting there on the bench, and I'm just looking at Greg, and Greg was there. I'm looking at Greg, and I'm like, man, you know, adults, they're just so fat and lazy, and I just can't understand how they just don't work out. I just, I just don't understand it. I just, and then I became one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, then I became one, and I'm like, okay, I can work out, or I have two small children, <laughs> and they take a lot of energy, so I choose not working out. I mean, it's just kind of how it happened, and maybe you're better than me, and you still work out all the time, but, I mean, for no judgment zone. I mean, I just became an adult, and I was like, I'd love to work out, but whew, that's rough. And so I just sat there saying, I, I don't understand how adults cannot, or can just not work out, or, or... If I could rephrase it, I will never be like them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I will never be like them. And, and I don't know if you've ever said anything as unintelligent as that, but um, I did, and, and I just kind of was like, I'll never be like those adults. The rest of my life, I'm going to work out. I mean, I'm going to be the 80-year-old dude that's running marathons. Like, I'm going to be that guy. Still haven't ran a marathon. But um, I, I was completely committed to working out. But what I didn't understand when I said this phrase is that there was a principle working behind the scenes that I didn't even know about at the time. It was a principle that is working in all of our lives. Every single one of us, young, old, student, retired, whatever, it works in all of our lives. And I didn't realize it at the time. And this principle is kind of this, this dull, constant force that is always there. And most of the time, we aren't even aware of it. And here's what the principle is. Here's what the principle is. Naturally, naturally, we drift away from greatness, and we drift towards comfortable. It's just natural. We all do it. We all naturally drift away from greatness, and we drift towards what is comfortable. I mean, it happens. I mean, you, you've seen it happen. It happens in dieting. I mean, you started off, like, maybe even you had the New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose X number of weights. I'm going to lose so much pound. And, and you started off really strong, and you did, like, the Paleo Atkins diet or whatever. I don't even know what you did. But you did a diet, and you were completely committed to it. And, and your diet said no carbs. And then it was like a day later, you're already eating carbs. Because naturally... We drift away from greatness, and we drift towards comfortable. And that's not just true of dieting or exercise. I mean, it's true if, if you're a boss, if you own your own business, or you're the manager, or you, you, you understand this principle too, too because um, you started off your business, or you became like the, the CEO, or you became the manager, and you had all these visions, these ideas of what the future is going to look like, and how you're going to make your company, your organization better, and you had all of these grandiose ideas. In the beginning, you worked, and you worked, and you gave extra hours and extra time, and you pushed all your employees, and you made sure everybody worked harder, but then slowly over time... That greatness that you were striving for, your company, you drifted away from that and you drifted towards just kind of the comfortable, just kind of reaching the status quo, making sure we get things done. But really, what got left behind was greatness. This is true in your finances as well. 
I mean, when you set off financial goals, like you want to achieve this kind of financial goal, you want to be debt-free by the end of the year, or you want to save this much money, or you want to, you know, save up money to buy a car or buy a house, and you naturally start off strong with this idea, but you drift away from greatness, and you drift towards comfortable. I mean, it's true in all sorts of areas You can look at your life, and you know that you have drifted regularly away from greatness and towards what is comfortable. But here's where this takes a turn. Not only is this true for working out, not only is it true for dieting, not only is it true professionally, not not only is it true relationally, it's also true spiritually. Spiritually. I mean, you know this. You've seen it happen in your own life. I mean, maybe Pastor George gave a message earlier this year, and there was just something in that message that just, I mean, it reached your core. And you came to the front, and you prayed with one of the prayer team members. You prayed with Pastor George, or you even had a meeting with him or Pastor Tim, and you sat down, and you said, man, what you said stuck with me, and I'm going to change, and I'm going to be different. And you just kind of felt this kind of emotional thing where I, my life is going to be different because of what was said there. But slowly, over the course of this year and over weeks and months, You've drifted away from greatness, and you've drifted back towards comfortable. You've drifted back towards your old ways, your old habits. And some of us, some of us, and and man, if this is you, this is the safest place in the world to be this. We have drifted so far. We haven't lost our faith. But our faith feels so distant from us right now. Our relationship with God feels dry and empty. And if we could categorize it, we would say we're in a desert season. Because what started off so strong... We were stuck on greatness. We were going to do great things for God. Our life was going to be different. We were going to be committed. We were going to do what God has asked us to do. We started off there, but just slowly, as the days and weeks and life went on, we drifted away from greatness, and we drifted towards what's comfortable. And you might be wondering to yourself, why does this happen? Why does this happen spiritually? Why does this happen in all these other areas? Why does this happen? And there's a a, a million different reasons. But one of the reasons I think this happens, I call it the tyranny of the good. The tyranny of the good. And I got this phrase, the tyranny of the good. I didn't make it up on my own. I got this book, or this phrase from a book called Radical Together by David Platt. It's the first chapter of the book. It's called The Tyranny of the Good. Fantastic book. If you're looking for a good read, it is a fantastic book. Radical Together by David Platt. But he talks about, he talks about that we allow good things, even good things in the church, to pull us away from the great things that God has in store for us. The great things that God has called us to do with our lives. We allow good things to rule over us. Or if I could rephrase it a little bit differently. We allow the comfortable things to rule over us rather than the great things that God has called us to. And I don't know what that thing is that God has called you to. Maybe God has called you to devote more time to prayer. Maybe God has called you to share your faith with more people. Maybe God has called you um, to read the scriptures more. Um, Maybe God has called you as a family to give more money away. I don't know what God has called you to do. But we let this tyranny of the good become the enemy of the greatness that God has called us to live for. And this is kind of what it looks like. We say things like, listen, I'm, I'm a good church attender. I'm a good church attender. I go to church all the time. Doesn't that make me a good person? Doesn't that make me good? I mean, I go to church very, very regularly. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I hope you're a good church attender. 
I hope you're a good church attender, but I, I, I hope that that's not your standard for greatness. I'm a good church attender. I'm a good volunteer. And I'm telling you what, I've been to a lot of churches. This church has the greatest volunteers on the face of the planet. I'm so grateful for every single person who gives hours of their week up to serve between donuts and greeters and kids church and tech and band and youth ministry all over the place. We got some amazing, amazing, amazing volunteers. But sometimes we just rest in being a good volunteer when God has called us to do something great. Last but not least, I'm just a good person. I mean, this is one that I hear all the time. I'm just a good person. I'm just a good person. Well, man, first of all, how are you defining good person? Like, what, what's your standard for de defining good or bad? Like, is it scripture or is it just kind of like a feeling? Like, you just kind of feel like a good person? I hope you're doing all of these things. I hope this is you. But what if... What if you're doing all these things and still, still, your relationship with God feels so cold and empty and dead? What do you do at that point? What do you do when God has called you to greatness but you have crept back into comfortable and your relationship with God just feels so distant? What do you do? Well, I'm really glad you asked that question because my note said that you would ask that question. So um, that's really good of you to know that you should ask that. And so we're going to be, to kind of figure out the answer to this question, what do we do with this kind of drifting towards comfortable, we're going to be in James chapter 1, and we're going to be all the way from James 1 19 through 27. We're going to get through the entirety of chapter 1 today. James 1, 19 through 21 says this. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Hey, listen, some of you would just be better off if you just did verse 19. You know, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, some of you put that in reverse order. You're quick to anger, quick to speak, and slow to listen. And that's the reason why your marriage is falling apart. I didn't say that. Um, but I, I, had this, I had this friend in, in college he was a, a quiet guy, super quiet guy, and I'm not. And so he was super quiet guy. And, and one day I asked him, I said, why, why are you so quiet? I mean, there's introverts, and then there's like extreme introvert. And he was like extreme introvert. Um, and I was like, why, why are you so quiet? And he gave me this quote that I, I loved it so much. It's one of my favorite quotes. And he, he, he said, he said, it's better to remain silent and thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of you have been there. A better way, uh, foot and mouth disease. You know, it's like, oh gosh, can I bring those words back? It's better to remain silent and thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. Some of you, your relationships would be so much better if you were just quick to speak or quick to listen. Sorry. Whoa. Whew. That about ended bad. If you were quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to anger, your relationship with your coworkers would be better. Your relationship with your spouse would be better. Students, your relationship would be better with your parents. Like all over the place, all of our horizontal relationships would get better if we were quick to listen, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And one of the things I think we do with this passage of Scripture is that we leave it there. We leave it at these horizontal relationships. But, but I think James isn't just dealing with horizontal relationships, peer-to-peer, friend-to-friend relationships. I don't think he's just dealing with that. I think he's also dealing with a vertical relationship. That our relationship with God, that we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. See, 
I, I'm not an expert, but if I could guess, if I could just look into your life and maybe have an honest conversation with you, and I was able to ask you, when was the last time you slowed down your life enough so that you could listen to what God is trying to teach you? Like, when was the last time, outside of Sunday morning, I mean, you're kind of stuck here on a Sunday morning, but outside of a Sunday morning, when was the last time everything kind of paused in your life, you suspended the normal reality, and you took time to be quick to listen to what God had to say to you, whether it be through Scripture, whether it be through godly counsel, when was the last time? And then, then when they gave you the scriptures or the godly counsel, gave you wisdom, were you incredibly quick to listen and even slower to respond? And then, is this not true? When sin gets called out in our life, is not our first response anger? When when there is sin that is in our life, are we not so quick to go, well, well, you don't understand the whole story. You don't understand what's really going on here. You don't really see the whole picture. You don't get it. And so we go completely against what James is telling us to do. If your faith has drifted into comfortable, probably it's because there's not much of a space in your life where you are listening to what God has to say to you. You're not listening. And then when you do listen, you are so quick to get angry. See, if you have sin in your life, if you have sin in your life, that sin separates you and puts this distance between you and God. It puts this gap there between you and God. And so James is saying, get rid of that sin. Get rid of that sin in your life because the reason you feel so far away from God is because there's this sin. And instead of allowing this sin to be the gap between you and God, let the word of God be the bridge that brings you two closer together. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak, slow to get angry. See, the first step, the first step of getting back towards greatness is listening to God. But it doesn't end there, clearly. Here's what verse 22 says. Do not merely listen to the word, but be, or, sorry, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Like You need to listen to the word of God, but it doesn't stop there. You need to be a doer. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you actually have a set of weights in your house of any kind? Maybe five pounds, ten pounds, whatever. You have a set of weights in your house. Okay, most people, most people, they kind of have some sort of set of weights in their house, even if it's just kind of like the two and a half pounds to make them feel good about themselves. You know, like everybody kind of has a, a, some kind of weight in their house. But if those weights, if you have those weights and they're just kind of sitting off in the corner of one of your rooms, collecting dust, um, you know how helpful that is? Zero. It's not helpful. I mean, in fact, you could own an entire, you know, weight room set. I mean, you could have the bench press, you could have all of it, and you could have an entire room that's dedicated to it. You have one of those rooms that, like, is filled with mirrors, so, like, you're like, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, you're flexing all the time. You, you've got all the weights set up, but if those weights just sit there... And you don't ever use them, they're no good. I mean, maybe you, I mean, you had a late night taco run and you saw a Bowflex commercial and you're like, I need that. And so you bought a Bowflex and regretted it ever since. But you got a Bowflex and it's at your house. And despite how great everybody looks on those commercials, you're still sitting there like, 
Nope, hasn't happened yet. And it's because you don't use it. It's because you don't use it. It, it, It's sitting there. It's sitting there. But just sitting there is of no use. See, we can create the space to listen to the word of God. We can create the space where we have godly friends who are giving us godly counsel and godly wisdom. And we can have the time where they can actually share with us. Or we can learn from scripture or through prayer what it is that God wants us to do with our life. We can have that space. But if we don't do anything with it, it is meaningless. It is useless. It is like a man looking at the mirror and then walking away being like, I don't remember what I look like. It's useless. You see... Um, when, you, when you speak regularly for a living, um, you, you have people come up to you and, and, hey, it's a great, great message, great sermon, great talk. And, and I, honestly, I, I love it. It's so encouraging when you, when you say those things to me or any one of the pastors. It's very, very encouraging. We love to hear those words. It's so good. Um, but what I love to hear more than great talk, great message, great speech, I love to hear Here's how I put it into my life. You, you understand? Because I can give great talks till I'm blue in the face, but if you don't do anything with it, it's useless. It's meaningless. Not our church, okay? This is, all, this is other churches, okay? Because we have the best church in the world, but not our church. But there are so many people who are fantastic sponges. They soak up everything spiritually they can. They got the Christian radio on in their car. That's all they listen to. They're regular church attenders. I mean, they go to small group. They just want more and more and more Bible study. And they want more and more and more scripture. And they want to listen, 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 listen. But you look at their life and they're doing nothing with it. And you look at their life and you're like... Um, hey, when's the last time you actually shared your faith with somebody? I, I don't even know. But, but you're in a Bible study five nights out of the week? You, so you know all the truth, but you're not doing anything with it? Jesus would call you a whitewashed tomb. You look pretty on the outside, but on the inside you're dead. Maybe the reason you have drifted away from greatness and towards comfortable is that you are an awesome listener. You're great at it. You're great at it. You're great at listening. But you don't do anything with it. You don't do anything with it. And it's useless. Can I just tell you, Christianity and church is a really bad hobby. Like it just is. Like if you want a good hobby, go play golf. This is a bad hobby. And if you're just coming to church just to listen to things, at that point, it's just a hobby. Instead of just coming to church just to listen, begin to put what you learn here into practice every day of the week. If your Sunday isn't changing your Monday, then something is off. Something is off in your life. And the reason why you have drifted away from greatness and towards comfortable is because your Sunday has nothing to do with your Monday. But if we begin to listen and do, and then Sunday and Monday, they begin to affect each other. So I have a stupid little phrase, okay, safe zone, safe zone. I have a stupid little phrase to help you remember this principle. And here's what it is. Listen and do, and that will get you through. Listen and do, and that will get you through. Okay, I, I get it. It's cheesy, um, but you'll, you'll remember it. I, in, in fact, it was really funny. Um, my, my brother-in-law is living with me, and I preached this, this sermon in youth group a few weeks ago. And we're sitting at the dinner table, and I was sharing some struggle. And he looked at me, and he's like, listen and do. That will get you through. And I'm like... Uh, hate having sermons thrown in my face, but 
Listen, you're wondering what to do with your faith. You feel like you've drifted away from greatness and towards comfortable. Then you need to listen to the word of God. Listen to godly counsel. Spend time where you can have space for God to speak to you. Listen to it. And then do what it says. Then do what it says. It's not rocket science. If it was, I couldn't preach it. <laughs> Listen, this Christianity thing isn't rocket scientist. Science. Scientist. Wow. I'm a professional speaker for a living. This is bad. We need to listen and we need to do. And that is what's going to get us through the season that we're in. See, because check out what happens when we do this. Verse 25 says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. He will be blessed in his doing. See, listen, listen. If we keep on listening and we keep on doing we will find that over time we will begin to reap the benefits and the blessings of God. We will begin to see and experience what God has promised and is faithful to give to us when we, over time, do the right things. Paul would put it this way in Galatians, Do not grow weary in doing good, for at the right time you will experience the harvest. You're going to feel this tendency. Even after this message, you're going to feel this tendency to want to drift. Starting tomorrow, you're going to feel this tendency to want to drift from God. It just happens. But if we will continue to make the right decisions over time, hear me, even when the wrong decision seems easiest... If we will continue to make the right decisions over time, we will see that God will slowly pull us out of the desert and into the promised land. So, James is about to, and we're almost done, James is about to give us this litmus test for what it means to live a completely dedicated life to Christ. Like he's about to give us, these are the standards and here's what he says. Those who consider themselves religious, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained from the world. There's three things he gives right here. There's three things he gives right here as kind of the standard. How do you talk to people? I mean, you call yourself Christian. How are you talking to people? And if you've noticed, if you've noticed this, the more kind of you drift towards comfortable in your faith, the meaner you tend to be, especially to the people closest to you. Maybe you've never noticed that, but when, when things are off in your life is the moments when you tend to be the meanest to your kids, to your spouse, to your coworkers, to your employees, all over the place. When things are off, when we've drifted towards comfortable, is the moment where we no longer have a bridled tongue, but our tongue is just running free. Number two, number two. Is that if you are saying you want greatness, you need to be taking care of and visiting the orphans and the widows. You can spend the rest of your life trying to make a lot of money and be incredibly successful. But Jesus says through James that your standard for wealth should be that as it comes in, it begins to flow out so that I may bless other people. That God has blessed me so that I may bless other people. 
Like if you are wealthy, that's amazing. What a huge blessing from God. But you have been given that money in order to bless other people. And so I ask this question, when was the last time you actually did this? When was the actual last time you cared for orphans and widows? It's amazing when you experience other people's struggles and hurts that God infuses your own life with joy. So here's what I'm going to offer to you. And if you're not doing anything, go to the Winter Haven Mission this week. The Winter Haven Mission is an organization that we support in the area that helps the working poor and homeless in our community. They serve and love on them, and they do a fantastic job of doing it. We love them. David Berry, who leads it, is a great guy. Go, go down there and serve. Go down there and help. Find out how you can volunteer. Do something great. Or, I'm, I'm taking a trip in the end of October to Haiti. And we're going to be ministering to 25 to 30 girls that have no family. We're going to be loving on them, and we're going to be caring for them, and we're going to be helping make some things better for them. And on top of that, me and another pastor are going to help um, teach some other pastors, here's how to minister to your kids when we leave. Like, here's how to really love on them well. Man, come on this trip with me. Come up to me afterwards and say, listen, I've been comfortable, and I'm not comfortable with comfortable anymore. I want to move over to greatness, and I want to start by going on the mission trip. I want to start by getting outside of my comfort zone, and I want to go help some other people. I invite you to do that. Last but not least, if your life looks no different than a non-believer's, there's something off in your life. So James calls us to keep oneself unstained from the world. Your life should look different. In the church, we should have more joy. We should have greater marriages. We should be the best bosses. We should be the most fantastic people on the face of the planet to be around. The truth is, there's a lot of grumpy Christians, and there's a lot of bad marriages and households, and there's a lot of people who just are not great bosses all over the place. But James is saying, if you want to call yourself a fully committed Christ follower, you need to look nothing like the world and completely like Jesus. It's time for us to turn the boat around no longer drift towards comfortable, and let's begin to drift and move towards greatness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you, and we need your help. Many of us came in here today, and we were just drifting. We were just moving farther and farther away from you, and we just... We need you to wake us up spiritually. Help us to no longer be cold and dead inside. Wake us up. Let us feel alive for you again. Let us become dedicated, committed Christ followers. For those of that, us that have been stuck, God, pull us out of that. Help us live lives that are devoted to you in every area. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you so much. Pray that you bless our week. Help our Monday to be different because of our Sundays. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being with us. Um, if you will please not forget your tithes and offerings on the way out, uh, we will see you next week.